And all God's people said, Amen. You may, you be, may seated, be seated, congregation. It is my distinct honor to be able to bring you the word this morning. Um, I guess you really need to watch what you say from this pulpit. Seems like it was a couple weeks ago that we were recognizing Dr. Cohn and basically giving him a word of thanks. And in that, I said that I really wanted to be like him <laughs> when I grew up. So, ladies and gentlemen, be very careful what comes out of your mouth. One of the most transformative verses written in God's word that has absolutely rocked my world is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Please stand as we read God's word together. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Let's go to the Lord asking his blessing on his word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for your word, your eternal truth. And I ask you to do an amazing work in this time that we would see you and hear you. Thank you for your eternal word that never changes. And God, that we can bet our life on it. And I ask you for perseverance. I ask you for strength. I ask you to do an amazing work, not only in this place, but Lord God, I ask you to bless every single person that is standing in this place and watching it online, that we would be able to run this race in such a way that gives you the glory and the honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. My junior year of high school, I felt the call into ministry. And these verses actually solidified my call to ministry. They have now taken on a different vantage point, being that I am now in my 50s. As you know, Paul wrote this, to Timothy as an apostle. Paul, with this designation, has the expectation of obedience, not only from the churches he was writing to, but also the church leaders that were within those churches. Timothy, being around 30 years old when Paul wrote this, was being mentored by Paul. Earlier in this passage, Paul actually calls Timothy, my son in the faith. I've got five points. I can't do the 12-point deals like Dr. Cohn can. So I've only got about five. And really, it's only about four because the fifth one is just a wrap-up and a summation of everything that we're going over. So the first one, ladies and gentlemen, don't get distracted from your purpose. In verse 13, Paul told Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget why I put you on this God's green earth. You need to do this. And he basically stated, this is what you need to be about. Give attention to it. There are so many things in this world that distract us. Since I graduated high school in 90, I've been a student minister, and I don't think you ever really get rid of that. I'm just a minister to other people that are a little bit older. Um, and what I've noticed through these years is we are all a little bit ADHD. Some of y'all are really ADHD. And you can talk to me later on. I have an amazing doctor that can prescribe some amazing medication. But we get distracted. And that's when we talk about these spiritual battles 
That's exactly what Satan wants us to be, is distracted so we don't see and grab a hold of what God has for us. Now, I believe the whole reason why Paul wrote this to Timothy was because Timothy was getting distracted with all the craziness that was going on in his world, in his church at the time. Now you're thinking, oh, no, no, he was a spiritual leader. Everything was good and he was fine. Uh, If we're reading this, the reason Paul had to write this to Timothy was because he wasn't quite reaching it. Do you know what I mean? We don't necessarily get a letter stating, oh man, you did this really well and you did this really well. It was more on, hey, don't forget who you are. Don't forget about your identity who is in Christ. Don't forget your purpose. Because if you get distracted, all of a sudden, you don't know what you're about. And ladies and gentlemen, my fear is that a lot of us are walking around with identity crises right now. We've forgotten who we are and whose we are. You are Christ. Christ should be defining who you are and your trajectory that you live and the way that you live. All throughout seminary, the first time I went and the second time that y'all paid me to go back, um, It was all about being a name bearer. You can start in Genesis and it goes all the way to Revelation. And in these scriptures, God is wanting us to be his name bearer. And what I mean by that, it's not Andy Donaldson standing up here doing this. You're hearing a word from God. And it's all about Jesus. And yes, I want to make my mark in this world. I think Paul wanted to make his mark in this world. He was encouraging Timothy to make his mark in this world, but it wasn't so Timothy could be praised. It wasn't so Paul could be praised. It was so Jesus could be praised. We need to be Jesus' name bearers in this. And when Paul's writing this, he's actually encouraging us, don't forget the purpose while you're in this world. Don't forget the purpose why I placed you in this sphere of influence, not only here at Sandia, but where you work. The family that you're a part of, no matter how crazy it is. Don't forget your identity is in Christ. Don't forget your purpose. Because when you grab a hold of that, everything becomes clear. And I'm not going to blow sunshine because it doesn't make it any easier. This world is hard. It's difficult. And it's frustrating sometimes. But God has a purpose for you in it. Just like he had a purpose for Timothy leading out with his church. And he said, don't get distracted. Don't forget why I put you in that church to teach and to preach the gospel because your identity is in Christ. Dr. Cohn for the last several weeks has been preaching on agape love. The only way we can truly love one another though is to have our identity in Christ. I mean, we can put on the fake smiles. We can put on the fake personas and say, yes, I really love you. When you're thinking, I don't want to be around you right now. You know, y'all have been there. I've been there. But the only way to truly love is to have our identity in Christ. The only way to truly grab a hold of God's purpose in our lives is to actually grab a hold of his identity in our hearts and in our innermost being. Two. Two. Second part, don't neglect your gifts. In verse 14, it alludes to the fact that Timothy has been given a miraculous gift. And it was the elders of the church laid hands on him. And what gift is not exactly clear? I can speculate on this. Commentaries have said that it was preaching, teaching, prophesying, you know, but it doesn't say exactly what it was. We as believers, if you have accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you've been gifted. You've been given a gift 
for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the church, to promote that gospel. Now, you don't want me up here leading out with worship and song. That's why God called Kim and Suzanne to do that. All right? Dan rushed up to me right before I came up, and he says, you better make sure your mic is on. The whole reason it was off is because I did not want that being projected to anywhere. I love singing praises to God in my truck with the volume up and in the shower. But don't neglect your gifts. You can even go back to what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth when he was talking about these gifts. And these gifts aren't something that you necessarily earn. It's not something that, oh, well, you're a good guy, you're a sweet lady, and you've earned this. It's by grace. God gives you these. We don't earn these gifts. But ladies and gentlemen, we have to use it as the body of Christ. And he was encouraging, he meaning Paul, was encouraging Timothy, don't forget about your gift. Use it. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes the same thing for us. Don't forget about your gift. Use it. You have been placed in this body of Christ here at Sandia Baptist Church to use your gift. We have some amazing teachers that spend all week pouring into God's word and asking for God's revelation and they lead out on Sunday mornings. And we've got some amazing Awana leaders that prepare all week to lead out on Wednesday nights and I'm leaving a bunch of people out. But Lord, this is, this is what it's about, using your gifts. How has God gifted you? How do you fit in the body of Christ? And Paul was telling Timothy, don't forget it. That spiritual battle that we were singing about at the beginning of the service, the forces of darkness wants you to forget and be distracted. God's word wants to bring you back to focus to remind you who your identity is in and what we need to be about. Point number three, take pains to make progress. Take pains to make progress. And this is not politically correct in whatsoever, shape or form. So you're not going to hear that from this pulpit. This is hard. Verse 15 and 16. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Verse 16, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. We need to go back to the original meeting of Meditate. Not some Yoda thing here lately. Meditate in the modern sense, is passive and uncritical and, ugh. <sighs> That's Greek, by the way. <laughs> Paul is talking about thoughtfully and attentively working on those things God has placed in your heart and in your path and in his word. Be fully immersed in your work. It's not going to come easy. Don't fall into that lie that this world, this life, this Christian walk is easy because it isn't. It's going to be hard. When Jen and I first adopted our boys, um, we got a book for them. And the title of the book was Do Hard Things. And all throughout the book, it was talking about how to build a fire and how to do these really cool things. But it took work. It wasn't something that was just handed to you. So many in our world right now want to cut corners as fast as they can by the seat of their pants, not thinking before they actually act. How many of our kiddos are now taking the easy straight and it's a path of destruction. 
They're into drugs. They're into alcohol. They're into premarital sex. They're into these identities that are based on social media and this world rather than on our risen Savior. So I go back to our first point that we made. Don't get distracted from your purpose, your identity. Because if we have that, then we know what our purpose is and we're able to strive and we're able to work hard because in the working hard for something, I don't mind working hard for something if there's an end goal. I don't mind sweating it out. I don't mind spending the time in it if there's an end goal. But if it's for nothing, then it just is for nothing. God's word has given us this very clear plan about how we need to live our lives, about what we need to do, about how we need to live each and every moment of our day. And he says, your identity needs to be wrapped up in me and I will give you a purpose. I can't promise you that it's going to be easy, but I'm going to give you a purpose and strive for it. Paul, throughout all of his writings, is talking about running the race, persevering, that it's a battle. And it is. It's an absolute battle to live for Christ. And I think we do an injustice to our children and our grandchildren when we tell them, oh, that's going to be easy. Ladies and gentlemen, no. We need to tell them that those things that are of God are sometimes hard. They're hard to stomach. They're hard to figure out sometimes. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to y'all and say every time I open God's word, it's easy to understand. It's not. I'm not going to tell you it's easy to live because it's not. It's easy to take the easy street. It's easy to, to, to fudge on this and lie about this. It's hard to stand up and be a man of God and not lie and be a man of integrity and be a woman of integrity. That's what Paul is encouraging Timothy to do right now. And I really, truly believe that's what he's not only calling us as individuals, but that's what he's calling the church to do. And I'm not talking about Sandy Baptist Church. I'm talking the church as a whole, the body of Christ. We have got to stand. We have got to do hard things. We've got to be willing to have a little bit of pain in our life to struggle sometimes in our life, to sweat, to put in the hard work. Paul is absolutely stepping on my feet right now. When he instructs Timothy to take pains in working intelligently, paying attention to get into your work while focusing on it, while we think hard about what we are doing. How many of y'all would just like to Sometimes close the Bible, put it on your nightstand and say, okay, God, I I don't want to do this anymore. I've been there. I think we all have. But what Paul is encouraging Timothy and the church to do is to open it back up again. God, what are you teaching me? What do you want me to do? And I want to do it. Number four. And this is kind of the last point, but really number five is, but five is a summation. So number four, so we're we're getting close. I'm not going to be a 50-minute Frank, I promise you. Persevere to win. Point four, persevere to win. In verse 16, 16b, the second sentence, persevere to them because if you do, you will save both yourself and And your hearers, those people God has entrusted to you, that he's put in your path. You have a moment here to be able to persevere, to save them, to show them who God is, to share with them, this is what God's done in my life. This is how much God loves you. And this is how much God has a plan for your life. Other versions, if you're in King James Version or the old King Jimmy or whatever the case may be, it says, take heed, watch yourself, pay close attention, persevere to win. What are you winning? 
It says, persevere because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. Guys, it's salvation. God has entrusted us with these people in our world so that we can share salvation, the gospel with them, so that they may know what it is to be a child of God. Jen and I took Bob and Vicki out to lunch before they left for their assignment in the East. And I asked them, I said, how can I be praying for you guys? How can we be praying for you? And they said, we want to make a difference. We're in our late 70s, and we can't run around like we used to. But God revealed to us, we need to breathe life into these young pastors and young church leaders. And that's what they want to be about. Yesterday morning, I got this call from my son and he works at Discount Tire and he said, dad, the house is on fire. And I'm like, what? He said, you need to go outside. It looks like the house is on fire. I ran outside and the neighbor directly to the west of us, his house was on fire. Ran over there and I grabbed our hose and I run over there and I'm in the middle of his lawn trying to put out Basically, it's a grass fire and his shrubs, and all of a sudden, it's engulfed the front of his house. Other neighbors are running out with their hose, and they've got buckets. And you know how you have those moments of, it's not working. I had that moment when ash was falling on me, and I have my little stupid garden hose, and I'm trying to put out this raging inferno, and I'm like, God, this isn't working. And then all of a sudden, I see out of the corner of my eye neighbors that are coming in with their hoses. And we were able to, thank God, save the house before it became a raging inferno. And in 10 minutes, it felt like it was 30 years. The fire department showed up and they were able to put the rest of the fire out. But how many times do we feel like, God, I can't do it with my little garden hose anymore. It's not enough. God has called you to the place where you're at, to the family where you're at, to the church where you're at, for this specific time to do those things that he's placed on your heart to do. And we need to be obedient to those. And even when you feel like it's a little stupid garden hose and you're trying to put out this raging inferno, God has your back because the fire department's coming. He loves you. He has a purpose for you. Point five. Be a person of the word. And I'm going to step back from that. We as Sandia Baptist Church need to be a church of the word. And I'm going to step back from that to the body of Christ. We need to be the body of Christ that is defined and our identity is on the word of God. Looking back at verses 12 all the way through the end of this chapter. Our identity, our purpose is found in Christ. No matter what profession we have, mechanic, professor, teacher, our true job is to share Christ with those he has entrusted us with. Some of us and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not going to even look up so I can't even be accused of this, are no longer considered young. (laughs) But as when this was written to Timothy, I told you at the beginning that this passage has taken on a different vantage point for me. I no longer look at myself as a Timothy. 
I see it from Paul's point of view and how I need to grab a hold of this part of my life and love on and mentor and equip as many people as God has entrusted me with. And now I'm looking around to each one of you. Who has God put into your life that you need to love on, that you need to breathe life into? I can't tell you how many people throughout my existence that men and women have come alongside me and breathed life into me, shown me this is God's word. This is how we need to live. This is how you can be a man of integrity. And not only this, but this is how you teach. This is how you preach. This is how you love on people. This is how you do hospital visits. This is how you go into someone's hospital room and love on them. This is how you talk to somebody and pray with somebody and love on somebody. can't tell you how many people have come alongside me because I couldn't have done it on my own. I'd be a blithering idiot. But God has now changed my focus to where eh, it's not Timothy anymore. Just like he did with Bob and Vicky. Man, I want to bring as many church leaders and young men and young women alongside to show them how much God has a plan for them. How much God loves them. And yes, we have to do hard things. <laughs> do you realize when Paul wrote this? He was at the end of his life here on earth. Paul probably wrote this like 64, 67, right around that time. And he was martyred in 67. God has given each and every one of us this moment in life to love on people and to understand what our identity is and our purpose is. And my prayer is that we can grab a hold of it. Not only just the individuals that are in here, but we as a church can grab a hold of that. You'll have an opportunity next week to receive one of these cards. And it's an invite to our Easter Resurrection Sunday service at the end of this month. In fact, you're going to receive two of them. And on the back side, it says, my name is. You're not receiving them today. The whole reason is, I want you to dedicate this week to prayer. God, who are my two? Who are the two people that you brought into my world and my path that need to be here? And I'm not talking about church hoppers. I'm not talking about somebody that is already a follower of Christ involved in a church home. I'm talking about somebody that doesn't know Christ, that does not have a church home. So my challenge to you is pray for God's revelation to reveal to you two people because you're going to get this card next week at the beginning of service. And we're going to touch base with it a little bit more next week so you can know kind of what's going on. Because we're getting excited about Easter. Man, it's a time in the year that people are more in tune with those spiritual things. They're ready to hear a word from God. And I want us as a church to be able to equip you to be able to go out and bring them here. Because Dr. Cohn is excited about bringing a very strong evangelical message that Sunday morning. Is your identity in Christ? Do you understand what your purpose is? If you don't, at the end of this service, we're going to have a time of invitation. We have some people down here at the front that would love to encourage you in your walk with Christ. And if you don't have a walk with Christ and you want one, we would love to share with you how you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you don't have a church home, Sandy of Baptist is an amazing fellowship of believers. And we would love to have you a part of the family here. 
After the prayer, we're going to have a time of invitation. That's your opportunity to stand and make your way forward to make these decisions solidified. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. And Lord God, I ask you to do an amazing work in our hearts, in our minds.